Welcome everyone to another episode of Voices for Tibet. I'm Karma Tensum. I'm with the Tibetan Children's Education Foundation. The mission of our foundation is to try and help preserve Tibetan culture by raising awareness of it here in the West. So on the Voices for Tibet program, we are trying to capture the voices of folks who support Tibet, Tibetan culture, or even Tibetan Children's Education Foundation. Today on the program, I have another remarkable friend of Tibet. Her name is Valerie Hellerman. I had the privilege and pleasure of working with Val for 10, for more than 10 years actually at the Tibetan Children's Education Foundation where she was our program manager. So thank you so much, Valerie, for joining us on this program. Tashi Dile, and can I start off by asking you to introduce yourself to our audience? Yes, thank you, Karma Tashi Dile. Um, yes, it was my privilege to be the project or program manager for TCEF for, I think it was actually 12 years. It was a job that I absolutely loved. And, um, I got to know, I always had an interest in Tibetan people. I had taken refuge in Tibetan Buddhism in 1976. Oh. So when, um, when I moved to Montana, I was a little sad that there wasn't much of a, there wasn't any Tibetan community. And um, at the Halter Museum, I had worked on bringing Lapsang Somtan, who's a pretty famous Tibetan monk who also is a um, very famous mandala maker and that's where you and i actually met karma yes that's was, right, right oh my god there's a tibetan man in his family <laughs> <laughs> i was so excited and we became friends and led to me joining tcef and that was such a privilege right right right, right. So, well, we are going to talk a lot about TCF, our years together, but now you have branched off into Hands on Global, this separate nonprofit that is located in Helena. I wanted to also learn a little bit about that. Tell me a little bit about Hands on Global. Well, Hands on Global was actually born out of a TCEF project in Zanskar. Um, while working with TCEF, I met Geshe Yantan, and he asked me um, to come and see the healthcare situation and evaluate it in Zanskar. So of course I was like, yeah, Zanskar, I'd love to go there. So I organized a little service trip and um, the group and I evaluated the healthcare system. And at that meeting, um, the Dalai Lama was in Zanskar and we had an, an audience with him. And I had met him previously through TCEF. And we so at this meeting, we talked about the healthcare system in Zanskar. And he said to me, you must continue this work. Right. I was like, okay, whatever you say. <laughs> <laughs> Not quite sure what that meant. Right. But then I was sort of whisked away to several meetings with the Zanskar Health Committee. And long story short, um, we had to form a, another nonprofit to do this work because TCEF is really education based and this was medical based. Right. So, and from that, so we still go to Zanskar every year and mm -hmm. do a medical camp, and the Dalai Lama funded a hospital. So, we work there and help develop that every year. Mm -hmm. And we have also branched out into general refugee work and Hands on Global has done seven trips to the refugee camps in Greece mm -hmm. and three or four trips to the southern border of the Mexico, US and Mexico. Wow. So, and I am so grateful because the skills I learned as a program manager at TCEF really helped me to establish Hands on Global and to do the work that we do. Right, right, right. right. Well, so I want to thank you, you know. As a refugee myself, I know how vulnerable this community is. Aside from the physical discomforts of hunger, poverty, I also know that you know it can affect your psyche. 
in some way you are diminished just because you are a refugee. And so, well, I want to thank you for the work that you and your team do. I truly believe that you do amazing work. But I'm going to circle back to our amazing years with TCF. Can I just say one thing, Carmen? Yes, yes, sure. You have so influenced my work at Hands On Global because over our many years of traveling together to do different fundraisers, we've had conversations and you once, more than once, have said that refugees feel groundless, yes. that they, have, they don't own the ground underneath them. Absolutely. And, and that really stuck with me. And the refugees I work with now are totally groundless and they don't know where their home is going to be. And Absolutely. I always think back to your, you know, you're saying that even though now you were in the U.S. and right. it was before you got your citizenship right. and how, how devastating that was for you and your family to not be grounded in a really, country. Really, you know, well, that is so true. Um, I've been a refugee in India for over 40 years. In some way, you might see the Tibetan colony, see that we are sort of settled. But, you know, there was always a tenuous quality to our life. In some way, we were really never really grounded. You know, in mm -hmm. some way, we are always diminished because of just being stateless. Yeah. But let's talk about TCF okay. and the wonderful <laughs> travels that you did. I know you traveled far and wide in all these Himalayan kingdoms, connecting us to amazing people, introducing us to wonderful programs. Uh, foremost among them, of course, is the wonderful service trips that you did almost every year throughout all the years that you stayed with us. I know you alluded to one, the Zanska service trips, but we know that there were so, so many more programs. So let's go down memory lane, Val. Okay. Tell me a little bit about the wonderful time that you spent at TCF, the service programs, the service trips, and the amazing programs that you did. Well, the service trips were just fabulous. And the idea was to travel with a purpose and right. to invite people who I met at TCEF fundraisers or through the T the TCEF website who were interested in meeting the people that they were sponsoring or supporting or getting to know more about the Tibetan culture. Right. And so we did travel far and wide through Tibetan communities all over India. And it was really fascinating. We were able to share some skills. We did some carpentry projects, teaching young men and women how to build tables and bookshelves and soap making and sewing. And we did some, yeah, I mean, we had such great fun um, and doing some healthcare assessments. That was always great. Um, it, it was pretty amazing. And all of us on these trips and many people came several times. Right, so right. I, I remember we, that, yes. Yeah, it was successful that people would come three and four times. That was amazing to me. Yes. We would, um, so we'd always kind of start with going to Kid Selling because right. that was sort of the core TCEF sponsorship program. Right. Meeting the kids. And of course, everybody would fall in love with those children. They were just amazing. And right. we so enjoyed seeing how in that community of Clementown, Tibetan culture was, I mean, it was a Tibetan community in India, clearly. Right. You walk through the gates of Clementown and you were in Little Tibet. That's true. And that was, that was, in, that was really wonderful. And your brother, of course, Siring and your sister were just so gracious and welcoming. Right. But we really enjoyed working with the children. And I remember we always would bring books, right. you know, children's books for them, lots of picture books and then some uh, like junior novels because they were always thirsty for sort of, you know, American books. Right, right, right. <laughs> And visiting the elders, that was mm -hmm. always amazing. We did a couple of um, interviews with, um, I forget his name, but he was an elder who was one of the last speakers of one of your languages. Uh -huh, right, right, right. What language was that, Karma? It was the Yagra language. That's right, Yagra. 
that was really fascinating. We, I still have that interview somewhere on tape and it was really amazing because we talked a lot about his life in Tibet, yes. his village, and, and then cultural, how the culture was sort of, you know, he was one of the last Yagra speakers. True. And, and there's so much in language, so right. much of culture held in language. It was really sad to think that the language was dying with him. That's true. You know, he was uh, <clears throat> that elder that you talked about. Uh, he passed away, I want oh. to say, a couple of years ago. Mm -hmm. But it's true, you know, Tibetan language itself per se um, is not being extinct. What we are talking about is some dialects, mm -hmm. some dialects that used to be spoken in Tibet, at least in exile and in diaspora. Um, some of those dialects are in danger of becoming extinct. So that was what Valerie was talking about. But Valerie, I'm going to put you on a spot and uh, ask you this question. So I know that you had some amazing memories. You talked about meeting His Holiness the Dalai Lama. I would have given my right arm to be in your position on that day. And then <laughs> I also remember there was this another, uh, you know, uh, this other time when you did a medical service trip and because of your and Paula and the service team members, this young monk who had lost his hearing in his childhood oh was able to hear for the first time. And, you know, I can still see the image of this person's face lighting up when he was able to hear. So like that, you must have some amazing memories. If I were, and then of course, we can we cannot forget the amazing Lama Peljor. Oh, what a fun person that. he is. <laughs> so if I was to put you on the spot and say, Val, choose for me your favorite memory of all these service trips, what would it be? Oh gosh, there are so many, but I'll tell you that young boy, that young monk. So uh -huh. we were in Yuxum Sikkim and I'll tell you a little background story of Yuxum. My husband and I had gone to India. Okay. After we left Kitsaling, we went to Sikkim and my husband went trekking and I stayed in this little village. And because I just can't sit still, I ended up, you know, looking around for things to do. And I found this little monastery where these, uh, maybe there were 25 young monks and it was so poor. They didn't have a, um, they didn't have good food. So anyway, by the time my husband came back trekking, from trekking, I had started a lunch program. I think I probably emailed you. You yes. said, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> so we started this lunch program. And I remember it was $2.20 to feed all of the monks per day. Yes. It was really inexpensive. So one of the monks, young monk there, had a hearing difficulty. And there was a little school there. And they thought he wasn't very smart because he couldn't hear, but you'd look <laughs> at this kid and his eyes were bright, you know? Right. Anyway, so the next time we came back, we brought a hearing tester and one of those really inexpensive $20 was little um, earplugs and a microphone that you wear around your neck. And we gave it to him. And I can remember Paula giving it to him, showing him how to use it and turning it on and he was startled. <laughs> it was like, we all just started crying. It was so amazing. That young man is now in Dharamsala at the Dalai Lama's monastery wow. studying. He was really bright. He uh -huh. ended up going to um, a monastery in Gangtok and then being transferred over there. So wow. that, was, that was an amazing experience. See, that was, you know, life-changing for that young, yeah. young I didn't yeah. know uh, the later transformations in his life. So that's fascinating to know that now he's in Dharamsala and is pursuing his spiritual studies. That is so amazing. And of so course, that, yes, carry on. Uh, of course, I can't diminish how exciting it was to meet His Holiness the Dalai Lama. Oh, of course. Several times. Right. <laughs> I felt really good and he would, I can remember a couple of times seeing him at a distance and he would point at me and laugh because I was usually crying in his presence. Right, right, right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. This one image I see where, you know, like you're 
practically in his holiness's embrace like yes. um you know really up close and i was feeling so jealous and thinking gee that well she has all the luck anyway <laughs> well um i know between you and myself we have spent so many years working together we could just carry on but i'm going to try and bring this back to voices for tibet okay um and so i want you today to be a really powerful voice for tibet and the tibetan culture and with all your work with tibet with tibetans with himalayans with refugees can you really give me one powerful pitch about why tibet is worth your time worth your service and worth your support why should the world care about tibet at this point of time in our history well i find it really um really important that Tibetans have this because they're Buddhist I believe because Buddhist is culture it is their culture it's yes. not only an intellectual or spiritual pursuit it's embedded in them culturally so there's this innate kindness and compassion that I have found in every single Tibetan community in Zanskar is a Tibetan community in fact the Dalai Lama has said it is um because of the chinese involvement in destroying tibetan culture in tibet that zanskar is the last authentic buddhist culture and you can just feel this this compassion this friendliness this care about each other this care about the land and it's really an example for the rest of the world right um also the interesting thing about Tibetans is Tibetan refugees they were in 1959 when masses of Tibetans left i think there were 4 million Tibetans left at that time following mm -hmm. his holiness the Dalai Lama and Nehru who was the prime minister of India at the time allowed them passage into India and gave them a community in Dharm Dharamsala mm -hmm. to live and other other communities around India, but with the leadership of the Dalai Lama, this refugee situation was really different because with the support of Nehru and the Dalai Lama's leadership, they immediately set up food programs, they set up schools, they set up cultural preservation. And it's really amazing that even being refugees and having come from horrible torture and terrible things that happen in their homeland they're thriving yes. they're thriving in india they they're thriving within uh, western communities in the world that took in tibetan refugees and they still have compassion and they they it's i find it just amazing the other thing i wanted to mention is during my work with tcef i did work with guchu sum Mm -hmm. which is um, the political prisoners, ex-political yes. prisoners association. And just another example of Tibetan Buddhist compassion. These people who have been horribly tortured and imprisoned for long periods of time, like 20 years or more, talk about their enemy and pray for their enemy. And, and they don't hate their enemy. They, they just believe that they there was something to learn from that that it was an opportunity for them to practice their beliefs in buddhism and to have compassion for somebody who was put in that position to torture them Absolutely. well right. that is something that we can all share in this world is not Absolutely. to hate our enemy but to learn from our enemy Absolutely. and almost every tibetan i know has that kind of compassion in their heart. And so, wow, let's spread that around the world. Right. It's <laughs> so true, Val, and thank you. See, that was a really powerful plug. I am so grateful. I also know that the last part about forgiving the enemy, um, during my years here in Montana, I had the privilege to translate for an amazing Rinpoche called Turku Sangha Rinpoche, the wow. one who created the Garden of Thousand Buddhas and well, I was translating for him and he also recounted his experiences of being in prison under Chinese occupation and how he actually came out of it with no animosity towards his 
captors. You know, he had immense good luck that in prison he met actually some spiritual masters who helped him to grow spiritually. But, you know, the fact um, that you talked about the Tibetan Buddhist culture encouraging this kind of compassion that allows you even the freedom to forgive and totally look upon your enemies with compassion. Um, so it reminded me about Dukkha Sangha Rinpoche. And then whenever there's an opportunity, I jump right in. You talked about his holiness of Dalai Lama, meeting Nehru, setting up communities and schools. And, you know, I'm, I'm always in awe of the wisdom and the foresightedness of his mm -hmm. holiness of Dalai Lama, because I, I can look no further than myself. Mm -hmm. My own education was sponsored by someone through the efforts of his holiness of Dalai Lama. And like Karma Tansom, there were literally thousands of Tibetan refugee children who had immediate access to education and it made all the difference in our lives. Mm -hmm. And so today, just like you are seeing me in front of your camera, there are thousands of Tibetans living in exile, living in diaspora, who's had a, you know, access to education, thanks to His Holiness the Dalai Lama. And this is where I'm going to ask you the last question, simply because while well, you have worked with Tibetans, you have known this culture. For young Tibetans listening into our program, how do you think that we Tibetans ourselves can help the Tibetan cause? can help our culture? You know, it, it's, um, well, I think that continuing to keep the culture alive by, um, you know, like people like um, Ludu, who are a member of um, the TIPA, Tibetan Institute of Performing Arts. Yes. You know, um, and Lapsang Santan or doing mandalas. I mean, even through dance and music and creating these sand mandalas, there's, it's all about harmony and, you know, compassion, all of it. It's, I mean, that's a huge expression in their, um, in their art. And so I think with young Tibetans to continue to, um, you know, keep their culture alive. And that is so true, Val, because even among ourselves, we say that even if we cannot have a country, let's make sure we have a culture. So, mm -hmm. you know, the part that you said is so true. So anyway, thank you so much, uh, Valerie, for, you know, firstly, for all your services to Tibet, to Tibetan Children's Education Foundation, and then today for being this strong voice for Tibet. Thank <laughs> you so much. You're welcome, Karma. It's been my pleasure to work with you and to get to know Tibetan people. Thank you. Tashitile. Tashitile. <laughs>